Hi, everybody, and welcome to the 12th episode of the Greenhouse Ensemble's Quarantine Soiree on Zoom. I'm your host, Rihanna Armolino, and I am streaming live from the chilly island of Manhattan. As I've been talking about these last couple of weeks, it is spooky season. And to keep you all updated on the movies that I've been watching, that I think you should be watching, I just watched Midsummer, which, or Midsummer, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, but it's by the same director of Hereditary, which I will not watch because it is terrifying, I hear. But Midsummer was excellent. It was spooky a little bit. It was really creepy, but it wasn't too, too scary. So it was a perfect one for me to watch. And then I also watched The Host, which is not the same as the book, which is also science fiction and is fantastic. But it was by the same director of Parasite, which is also a wonderful movie if you haven't seen it. But The Host was excellent. It was kind of funny, it was kind of scary, and it really gets you in the mood for spooky season. <laughs> Tonight's episode is called Six Feet Down, and it was written by Mark Cornell. It's directed by Greenhouse Ensemble member Matt O'Shea and stars Riley Austin Scott and Tim Moen. If you would like to support any of the artists in tonight's episode, you can do so in two easy ways. And we've just got QR codes to make it even easier for you. For those of you who don't know how to use a QR code, it's super, super simple. All you have to do is open the camera app on your phone and then hold it up to whichever QR code you wanna use. So the first way that you can donate is through our website, www.greenhouseensemble.com forward slash support us. And that's this QR code here. And that takes you to a tax deductible website where you can make a donation. Or you can simply Venmo us. It's at Greenhouse Ensemble or use this QR code here. And now without further ado, we're happy to share Six Feet Down by Mark Cornell. Todd? Todd? Where the hell are you, man? It's me, Will. I got your phone call. Todd? Shit. Fuck! Jesus, man, you scared the shit out of me. You scared me too, man. Didn't you hear me come in? No. What are you doing just lying there? I was experimenting to see if I could fall asleep. I try going to sleep at night in a bed. That usually works. Where's all your furniture, dude? Sarah took it. Oh shit, man, I'm sorry. Is that why you called? Your phone message kept cutting out. I only got half of it. You sounded insane. I wanna show you something. I went on the internet. I did some research on the bridge collapse. Here. Wait, so this isn't about Sarah? No, listen to me. You know all the people that allegedly survived? I made a list. Some have died in the hospital, and the others, they won't release the names. I did find one name of one guy who survived. I got it from this blurb in this tiny newspaper in Iowa. But the newspaper won't give me the name or the address or his phone number, nothing. It won't give me anything. And other than that one blurb, Google has nothing on the guy. It's like he doesn't exist. Yesterday, I went to the junkyard, Harold's Wrecking on the south side. I saw my car. Have you been down there? No. Here is a shitty printout of a photo I took on my phone. The car is crushed. There's about eight inches between the roof and the seats. It's practically pancaked. Nobody could have survived that. There's no way. There's no way. Look, dude, I know you're struggling with what's happened to us. We survived. And a lot of other people died. I get that. It's not what this is about, Will. What is it about, Todd? It's about the fact that I don't think anyone survived, not even me. What are you talking about, dude? I think I actually died. 
under the twisted steel of that bridge in the river, in my car, six feet down. I think I'm dead, Will. God. They told us later that when they pulled us out, we showed no signs of life. You didn't die. But bridge went down around what, four? Car sank below the water in what, about 10 minutes, right? And, and then the car filled up in what, what, like 45 seconds, right? How long were we drowned? You, you didn't drown. EMTs revived you. Says who? Says them. Says me. I was already conscious when you came to. They said, welcome back. You came back. And you're here now. What further proof do you need that you're alive? Remember what we said to each other as the car filled up with water? Yeah, you said, I guess this means we won't be making happy hour. You said that if we got out of this, that we were going to give up the video store. And you and Jenny and me and Sarah were all going to move to the coast. Get a little bungalow, party till we dropped. We swore up and down we'd do it. That was eight days ago. Let me tell you right now, I don't give a shit if I ever see the coast again in my life. So what? Don't you see what that means? Yeah, it means you and I can't commit to dog shit. We never could. I've never been this apathetic. Oh, the history department at Penn State would disagree with you. I don't care about reading or watching movies or taking a shower. You sure as hell seem to care that you don't care. And isn't that ironic? Do you have any idea how stupid you sound right now? I'm dead, Will. No, you're not. You're standing there, aren't you? Dead people can't stand up, can they? You can go for a walk. You can go outside, and the world knows that you are there. You're not a ghost. You talk to people. People talk to you, don't they? You go to work. You eat. You sleep. You crap. I read that the digestive system continues weeks after death. Come on, dude. This is crazy. We have organisms living in our stomachs and intestines that help us digest. We may die, but they don't. Stop. I Googled it. I Googled all kinds of things. For example, how can you be sure that you actually sleep if you don't dream? Everyone knows when they've been asleep. Maybe the dead don't. I've been lying on the floor since yesterday trying to fall asleep. Did I? How can I know? We have no concept of time when we're asleep. But you do when you're awake. Do you know what happens to blood as soon as you die? Yeah. The blood pools in the lowest area of the body, depending on the position at the time of death. I watch a lot of CSI. Oh. It's called hypostasis, or lividity, or liver mortis. It's one of the first signs of death. Do you want to see what my back looks like? No, I don't. You don't have to. Here. I took a photo of my back, and I set it next to a picture of a corpse I found on Wikipedia. Look. Look. See how similar they are? Todd, we were in a major catastrophe. Our bodies are traumatized. I'm black and blue too, dude. I don't bleed, Will. Oh, sure you do. No, I don't. Jesus. It won't bleed. It won't heal. Nothing will heal. Dude, what are you doing to yourself? I don't feel pain either. I can't even feel my heartbeat. You're breathing, aren't you? Yeah. Why am I breathing? Because you're alive, you fucking idiot. God, where's Sarah? Let me talk to her. I know she can straighten your ass out. Sarah? I told you she's gone. Where? She went back to Ohio. She says I don't love her anymore. She's right. I don't love anything anymore. Can't taste anything, smell anything. Take my pulse. See if you can take my pulse. I can't get a fucking pulse. Okay, look, I think... We just need to call Sarah or Jenny or, or someone else who can help you right now. What are you doing with that? I'm proving my point. She can't kill what's already dead. Hold on, man. <coughs> oh! <coughs> oh, shit. Oh, oh fuck. Oh my God. Will, Will, Will. Yeah, I stabbed my friend. My name is Todd, Todd Reed. You need to send someone right now. Wait. I'm okay. Never mind. I'm okay. Oh my God. 
I'm okay. You're dead too. What? You're dead too, Will. What are you talking about? I just stabbed you. There's no blood. What's going on? We're dead. We're both dead. No way, man. I was right. I was fucking right. No, no. You are dead. That's impossible. All this time you suspected, haven't you? And Jenny is freaked out, isn't she? Shut up. You are dead, Will. I am not dead. I am alive. <laughs> Have you been hungry? <gasps> Have you been thirsty? You still piss river water, don't you? When you talk to people, do you care at all about what they're saying? When you go outside, <laughs> does it matter if the, the sun is shining bright? The trees are bursting with color? But the world is a beautiful place? Do you care any more about anything? When was the last time you really wanted something? What makes a person truly alive, Will? Love? Laughter? Heartache? Are you experiencing any of those things? I don't understand. <laughs> something really weird happened to us on that bridge. And now we live in two worlds. <laughs> We're the walking dead, Will. You and me, man. <laughs> We're zombies. <laughs> We're, we're immortal. Congratulations, guys. That was really beautiful work. And Mark, you're here too. Hey, it's our playwright. Thanks for popping in, Mark. That was fun. Great. Love it. Wonderful. Cool. Great to see you stop by. <laughs> and right, <laughs> right at dinner time. Right at dinner time. Cool. Really wonderful work, guys. Oh, and you look, you're in color. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this is one of my favorite parts of the show when we get to sit and have a chat. So I would like to talk to you guys about these characters themselves. They're all feeling so, so numb and so kind of like disconnected from the world. I mean, granted, they're dead. And, you know, obviously that's not our circumstance. But I know that there have been times during this quarantine that I felt really numb and disconnected from the world. So I was hoping that you guys would share some times when you've experienced that and maybe some of the things that you've done to kind of overcome that and to keep moving forward. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when we, we first looked at Mark's script, we, uh, we, we saw it as a zombie story, but then we wanted to dig into the layers and what was really underneath and looking at it as a story about, uh, about depression and dealing with trauma. And, and what happens after a traumatic event. And uh, for both of them, it's the car wreck. And then right afterwards, you've got um, Todd's uh, longtime girlfriend leaving, picking up everything and leaving. So it, it's kind of that idea of being dead when everything in life just kind of goes gray for you. When, when the, the, all the red in your heart just drips away and, and it's just gray inside. So it's kind of, dealing with that whole um, thing. And I think we feel that a lot at times, especially during everything that's going on within the pandemic and all of it and finding your ways to um, embrace that. Cause we saw it as like a bittersweet story where they're facing this eternity of uncertainty with um, living in this way, but they're doing it together. Um, so I think that's a huge thing of, um, finding your people and your community. 
Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's a huge thing for all of us when we've been going through this is finding ways to stay connected with your community and with your friends sure. and family, you know, even if it's just through ways like this, you know, on a screen, which I feel like is how a lot of us have been having to connect these days. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can say that I, I feel like the times where I feel like I'm closest to depressed or depression or that sort of thing, it's just when there's not even when there's bad stuff going on and there's just nothing. You know, and, and sometimes it's not even I'm not feeling anything. It's just like I have nothing to do for the next week or the next two weeks. And it just kind of feels you do get that feeling of like pointlessness. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but I, I've I've found, especially during the pandemic, or I think we've all been forced to experience it. But um, sharing one way or another time with yeah, people you, you love and people you care about has been really helpful. And then just also thinking about just literally anything in life that gives you a little bit of purpose you know whatever whatever it is in the short term and the long term oh i've got this at work or i've got this with like someone's birthday is coming up i i got this gift for them just sort of like something to see beyond the next like 10 minutes almost um and like that life keeps moving and there are things to look forward to because i think that's that's todd's fears is there's nothing to look forward to this is he's just stuck like this by himself he thinks probably forever so um fortunately i'm not in that situation <laughs> yeah that's great i mean i i remember the beginning of the the pandemic um when theater shut down and then i was laid off from my job as a producer and i just had this stretch of nothing going on and it was really terrifying at first and it was for like you know, it, it was at the time where, you know, no one knew how long this was going to last. So at first it was like, wow, I have a break. And then it was like, oh my gosh, I have this never ending break. So it became like you're saying, Tim, like looking at all the positive things that you have to look forward to and then like adding hobbies and, and using that time. And now I feel like my days are, are super full, even though we don't have theater back yet. How about you, Riley? Uh, I think that like um, the trouble with uh, bouts of depression or even like depressive uh, moments is that if there was like a way to like a tried and true method of trumping your depression, nobody would ever be depressed. And uh, in kind of like a common cold way, like sometimes there are new depressions that you haven't experienced before that are have a cause that you can't quite identify. Like there's seasonal depression, which like, you know, usually stems from the change in seasons. But I think uh, this pandemic for me specifically, was like uh, speaking to uh, what everybody else has said, it was like a completely new experience of just like nothingness, um, which is, was really hard to grapple with. And it's still like, comes up all the time but I think the answer to for me solving it is like finding ways to occupy my time and spending as much time with the people I love as I can just because like who knows when we'll have all this time again I know I I personally was was working a lot more before this happened so I so I didn't get to see my friends and now it's like almost every night I could and uh, obviously safely, but to see the people that you love and spend time with them if you can, I think is at least one surefire way to, to uh, dull the pain, if not eradicate it at its source. Yeah, it's finding those ways that give you life and, and what really drives you and makes you feel alive. And, and um, that's why, you know, doing this project was even a real blessing because it's, uh, you know, for me, it's storytelling and it, it's... Um, conveying a message and all that and I got to work with these guys and you know we went into our rehearsals and it was kind of an unusual I mean this is a whole new medium of telling a story in a way um, but working through that process it's, it's it was uh, inspiring for sure Mark you yeah, want I to put your two cents in Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for doing it. That was that was that was great fun. I almost forgot about it. Right at seven o'clock, I was in the kitchen. I realized that it was that it was on. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, but it was great to see it again. It was great to hear it. Great to see you all do it. It was really fun. I I mean, when I <clears throat> wrote the play, it was just about what what it means to be alive, and I didn't re you know had no intention of or I should say, uh, I couldn't possibly foresee uh, this play as relevant in any kind of uh, uh, pandemic, but clearly, you know, listening to it, um, 
uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the inability to, co to connect with other people. Uh, these these two guys are going through I mean, that we're we're all <clears throat> going through this, um, and feeling and like you all said, just feeling isolated. Uh, but yeah, it really, the play does have a kind of a a, a, a pandemic fe feel to it. Uh, so uh, very true. These guys are so strung out, you know, um, and so disconnected. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I think we've all kind of felt that. So, yeah, for sure. Great. Well, thank you guys for being part of this tonight. Thank you to our audience, and we also here at Greenhouse want to give a happy birthday to Mara. We hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful day today. <laughs> And tune in next week for our 13th episode of the Quarantine Soiree, where we'll be featuring Responsible by Barra Swain. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.